Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Héo. Wow. Get ready for this one, everyone. Paul and I have been talking constantly for weeks, and we have something special for you. This is a two-part, four-hour series that covers everything you can imagine on plant and animal foods. If this is your first time listening, make sure to go back and start episode one. To catch people up, I'm Brian Sanders, and I've quit my job and dedicated my life to studying health and nutrition. I'm trying my best to be unbiased and to simplify the conflicting advice out there and distill down concepts into something anyone can understand. I'm not a doctor or nutritionist, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I've lost both of my parents to chronic disease and have set off on my own path for the last four years to study this topic and make sure I don't fall to the same fate. My role is a curator, the communicator, the curious mind collecting and spreading this information. I've interviewed over a hundred of the top scientists, doctors, nutritionists, fitness experts, and other health professionals, and have come to find some simple truths that I'd like to share. Today I'm talking to Dr. Paul Saladino, who received his MD from the University of Arizona and is also a certified functional medicine practitioner. He has quickly become one of the leading voices and experts on animal-based diets and nose to tail eating. He's a good friend and a wealth of knowledge. We just got back from Paleo FX in Austin and are getting ready to shoot the final interview for the Food Lies film. You guys are in for a treat. But first I have to ask you for your support. I'm working almost every night until midnight these days, trying to keep up with all my projects and content creation. So far I've done this all for free and it's taking a toll on me and definitely my non-existent bank account. You can support me directly by joining my Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash peakhuman or just search for peakhuman on patreon.com or of course you can click through the show notes. A couple dollars a month goes a long way. You can also support me through the Food Lies film, which is still on Indiegogo. We have all kinds of great perks like your name in the credits, the eat meat shirt, and the real foods coin. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And it's not possible without you. Now, please enjoy the wise words of Dr. Paul Saladino. Let's get this going. Dr. Let's Paul. Roll, bro. Let's roll, brother. You're the man of the hour. I feel like you're everywhere these days. I started talking to you a like, long time ago, getting you on the podcast, and I had a million things, and you had a million things. We're here. We're here, dude. Let's do it. I'm super stoked. It's just like every day I think of all these things that are in my mind and it's so exciting. Just get them out into the space and talk to intelligent people like you about them and just dialogue. I love it. Well, yeah, you're changing the way we think about food and I think it's great. That's why so many people want you on their podcast and you're getting out on YouTube and doing all these cool things because, you know, this carnivore thing is shaking people's ideas a lot. And then you're coming in with all this science, right? And you're, you're telling us why and, and just more than just, hey, you know, our ancestors ate meat. It's all good, right? You're getting to the next level. You're figuring out, you're doing the research. So, so many things we want to get to. We're going to try to take it step by step here, but from the top, I always think about this, and I think you've mentioned it too. It's like food contacts your body every day. It's the thing that comes in the most, right? Yeah, you breathe some air, you know, this and that. But food is direct contact with your body. It's the one thing we can affect the most, right? So we should be thinking about it the most. I totally agree with that. I've mentioned before that we take milligram or microgram quantities of drugs and they affect our body profoundly. And we're putting kilogram quantities of food into our bodies. I mean, you know, if we get down to the basic level, life is movement of electrons without getting too esoteric for people. Life is movement of electrons and food is electrons. Food is sources of electrons for energy. And there are micronutrients as well, but we are taking in kilogram quantities of molecules that have electrons. But those molecules, in addition to bringing us electrons, are signaling different things in our body. And we are getting... 10 to 100 times or even a thousand times multiple orders of magnitude greater than, you know, medications that can kill us or save our lives or profoundly influence us. We're using, you know, levels of food that are multiple orders of magnitude higher than that. So we are getting huge amounts of molecules in our bodies from food that affect our cellular processes at every level. They affect hormones and our immune system. And it's just incredible. Food is medicine and that's passe to say, but it's one of the more true statements I can think of at this moment, there's nothing in my opinion that we can do that is going to influence our bodies at a more cellular biochemical level than food. And of course, sleep and stress and community are important, but food is just 
so many different molecules that are going to change the way we live and affect quality of life positively or negatively. Absolutely. And it's funny because I know some people who are just, just outside the health and nutrition world that are focused on health and they don't think that food matters that much. And it's just really crazy to me. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I think I know some of the people you're talking about and it's a source of much consternation for me too. I'll piggyback on what you're saying there and say that it's my strong opinion. And I think you'd agree with this, that food is much more than calories. It is not enough to just think about your macros, to just to just, you know, adjust your macros, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. That is a very powerful intervention and that can change body composition. But I think there are a lot of people in the space who would say to people, just adjust your macros and then take a multivitamin. And that to me is the, is a huge disservice to micronutrients and the nuance and the elegant, like the elegant simplicity and the elegant balance of our immune system. I think that's what those people are missing is the way that the food we eat, the quality of the food we eat is an immunologic signal. I kind of hinted at this earlier that all those molecules coming into us are immunologic signals. That's the key is this is the immune, the immune system is what we're influencing here. So it's, you cannot just think macros and a multivitamin that is not going to be good for your immune system. We know that that's not the way to do it. Food is a completely different signal than that fake sort of, you know, construction of the the reductionist view. Well, yeah, I mean, I wasn't even thinking about who you're thinking of. I've had people on my podcast and had sort of not debates, but like pushbacks on, on them. And I don't like to argue on my own podcast and have a guest on. I feel like it's really rude. It's not the place, but I, I do have very different opinions than, than some people. And it also food affects your genetics or epigenetics. And I read Deep Nutrition by Kate Shanahan, which was great, and talking about this, it's it's signaling to your body and your genetics, and that our bodies expect certain signals with this food. And what's crazy is I just <laughs> told you I, I'm starting to train for a decathlon, and I was at the UCLA track with some great athletes, and they were like, "Oh, what's your deal, dude?" And I started telling them they had no idea what paleo was. You know, I'm trying to meet them where they're at. I was like, "Oh, you know paleo?" They're like, "I don't know." They thought I was 26. You know, I'm about to be 36, and they, they just didn't understand this. I'm like, if you give your body what it expects, we were, you know, millions of years of evolution. We get it what it expects. It works well. It, it all makes sense. And I could see the, the, their eyes light up and it was kind of making sense to them a little bit. So let's jump into all this because it's so obvious when you think about it from an evolutionary context, when you, think, when you get into all the science and that everything that we've thought about food is kind of backwards wrong. Oh, and also, this is sort of a common quote I've seen on Twitter a lot. So we can start with this. Is people said, you go to a doctor and you're like, hey, everything, all my lipids are better. I've lost weight. 10 things are better. And they say, oh, how'd you do that? And if you said a plant-based diet, they'd like give you a high five and they'd say you're a genius. But if you exactly. said it was eating all meat, they'd say you're going to kill yourself. Stop. So let's or, just start there. Yeah. <laughs> if you said an animal-based diet. So I think one of the things just so that people know, a lot of times in the podcast, we may say a meat diet or eating a lot of meat, but really from my perspective, and I think you would agree with this, we're talking about eating animals nose to tail. So that's just kind of the overarching context when we're talking about eating animals. I like this idea um, of a whole foods animal-based diet, but you're exactly right. That anecdote is so true that if you went to a doctor and you said, I've been eating only animals, all I eat is animals nose to tail, I eat zero plants, they would just, their jaw would hit the floor and they would have this incredible cognitive dissonance. And it's just this idea that in the popular thinking within our society right now, for whatever reason, people have an easier time imagining, intuiting that plants are healthy. And this is what I love about the carnivore space. This is what I love about being in this space is that I believe, and many people in this space believe that that is completely wrong. And we mm -hmm. will set the stage for that. And we, we can look at an evolutionary context. We can look at uh, a zoologic context and a, bot, a botanical context, which will probably be some of the most um, telling places to begin the story. But the idea that a plant-based diet is good for humans doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we think about it. But I just want people, if they're listening and they're thinking that a plant-based diet is good or they've heard that notion, I, I always when I'm on these podcasts, request that listeners kind of put aside all their preconceived notions and just try and imagine they're starting with a blank slate uh, because we've just been fed this idea for so long and it's just this bias that we have to sort of 
we have to correct in our lives. You know, we have this, this bias that plants are good for us. And like you're saying, physicians have the bias, but if we think about it, you know, evolutionarily, let's just begin with evolution. I did a podcast on my YouTube channel with Miki Bendor, who's a paleoanthropologist. And we talked about a number of studies that have come out recently looking at a number of ways that anthropologists and paleoarchaeologists and paleoanthropologists can determine what ancestral man was eating. On that podcast, mm-hmm. we kind of talked about the evolution of man, which I think is quite fascinating. I love these ideas of where we come from. And we talked about the fact that humanoid people have been around for 4 million years, beginning with Australopithecus. And there's Australopithecus afrensis, which is Lucy, which is people might've heard of Lucy, but that's actually not our lineage. That's not the Homo lineage. About 1.8 million years ago is when Homo erectus arrived and Homo habilis. And then um, Homo sapiens is a very new species on the face of the planet. Um, I know you've got a website, Sapiens, so you're familiar with this concept that Homo sapiens mm-hmm. is very different than Homo erectus. But 300,000, 350,000 years ago is the is a blink of an eye. And that's how long Homo sapiens has been around. But Homo erectus went extinct about the same time that Homo sapiens arrived. But Homo erectus was around for about 1.7 million years. There are many people who believe that Homo erectus will be the longest lived Homo species on the planet and that Homo Homo erectus will outlive Homo sapiens. Um, At the rate we're going, I wouldn't be surprised if we we eliminate ourselves from the planet, you know, sooner than 1.7 million years of Homo sapien evolution. But we can actually go back with paleoanthropology to 70,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago. So this is very recent. And we can look at the bones and the collagen of Neanderthal and Homo sapien individuals. These are two different species. So people may also know that there's there was a Homo sap or there was a Homo Neanderthalensis, and that is Neanderthals. And that species was existing at the same time as Homo sapiens, and they were in the Neander Valley in Europe. And Homo sapiens probably came up from Africa, and the two species kind of collided or connected. And there are lots of theories about whether we interbreeded. We all know if we've done 23andMe that we have Neanderthal genetics. Um, people sometimes at parties like mm-hmm. to talk about how much Neanderthal they have in mm-hmm. them, but we have some Neanderthal genetics. Um, So clearly there was some intermingling of our species, but Homo sapiens became the species that moved forward. But I think that these studies are so interesting, and I'll just note a couple of them for people. Um, You can let me know if this is something that's too uh, cumbersome for the the podcast or if people will be interested in this. But I like to talk about the names of the studies on the podcast so that people can actually go back and look for them. I'll put them in the notes, yeah. Yeah. So there are a few studies that have come out recently um, talking about these D15 nitrogen values in the collagen of Neanderthals and these early Homo sapiens in Europe. And this is from about 70, 80,000 years ago. So these paleoanthropologists can go back, can look at these bones and look at the amount of collagen, look at the collagen, and then look at the, uh, the D15 nitrogen values in the collagen. And the first study is called Exceptionally High D15 Nitrogen Values in Collagen Single Amino Acids confirm Neanderthals as high tropic level carnivores. And this is so fascinating because what Miki was explaining to me and what I've learned speaking with paleoanthropologists is that in plants, there's a certain amount of nitrogen, but that nitrogen concentrates as we move up the food chain. And so by looking at the amount of nitrogen in collagen in the tissues of these, these preserved Neanderthals and early humans, we can get a sense of their trophic level. That is, were they eating plants? Were they herbivorous? Were they eating animals? Were they eating plants and animals? Or were they carnivores? And the amount of nitrogen is so high in these collagen samples that they are at the level or higher of known carnivores uh, at the time. So they find a lot of bones from, he was saying, hyenas in caves, all Mm -hmm. these like pack animals in caves, which are completely carnivorous. And they can look at the amount of nitrogen in the bones of a hyena And then they'll look at the amount of nitrogen in a Neanderthal or an early Homo sapien. And Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens have more nitrogen. So it suggests that we were eating bigger animals because the bigger animals concentrate the nitrogen more. So this is just beginning this sort of anthropologic story that if we look at the bones of our ancestors from 70, 80,000 years ago and this Neanderthal species that we probably intermingled with, most of them were probably, quote unquote, high level trophic carnivores or hyper carnivores, meaning that they were eating probably 70, 80 percent maybe even 90% of their food from animals. And it's just such an interesting idea that, well, our ancestors were basically carnivores 
And there are a number of studies that, that substantiate this as well. There's another interesting one, isotopic evidence for the diets of early Neanderthals and early modern humans. Uh, it does the same thing. It sort of compares these um, it compares these nitrogen levels in the collagen samples. And then the third one that people can look for is called stable isotopes reveal patterns of diet and mobility in the last Neanderthals and first modern humans in Europe. So they all kind of show the same thing that these peoples, at least based on the collagen samples, had very high levels of nitrogen suggesting that ancestrally at least, and we can talk about how relevant that is for us today, we have come from a lineage of people who were able to subsist, to subsist on exclusively animals for the majority of their diet. And that, I would argue, that probably had a great deal to do with our success as a species as homo sapiens and the persistence of us as humans. So that's such an interesting, I think, anthropologic story for people to think about. Like, this is where we've come from. We were eating animals from the very beginning and lots of animals. The majority of our diet was animals. Large we, animals, large fatty animals, elephants and, and mammoth. And I did talk to Mickey Bendor as well. That's right. You've had him on the podcast, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't release it yet, but yeah. Oh, a secret. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah, Mickey was telling me about these megafauna, these, these, you know, four to five times the size of an elephant now, I guess what would be considered a woolly mammoth, the stuff of our dreams of childhood, you know, but it's hard to fathom mm -hmm. how big an animal like that would be. But these megafauna were just full of fat. And Mickey has this theory, which I think is quite compelling, that fat, humans were fat hunters. And I think it's so interesting. If you look at the amount of energy return that an early human or Neanderthal hunter gets from hunting a large animal, it's so much better when you're hunting a big animal than it is from hunting small animals or getting plants. And he has a graph, he has a, a graphic that he mm -hmm. showed at one of his ancestral health symposium talks where he talks about this, that when you're looking at small animals, there's, you know, the amount of calories you have to expend to get that small animal isn't going to get you as good a return on those calories that you expended in the calories you're going to get. And that, that the differential between a small animal return on calories is actually not that much different than a tuber. But these big animals were five to six, 10 times better. You know, you might expend X amount of calories to get the animal, but you're going to get this huge amount mm -hmm. of calories. And as we know, micronutrients and these other nutrients that make our biochemistry go. So hunting the big animals was probably a big part of what made us human. It's super fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, okay, so we should drill down into the science. So we know everyone listening knows that this, the vitamins and all this stuff is much more bioavailable in the animal foods and that the plant foods are fallback foods or you call them starvation foods, right? So it's, there's really no reason why we ha we ate them unless we needed to eat them. Yes. And this is one of the things that I think is so cool about humans and probably Homo neanderthalensis or Homo sapiens is that we evolved to be what I would argue is a facultative carnivore. There are obligate carnivores, which people might think of like a tiger or a lion that really doesn't eat plants ever. You know, if there are no animals, that, that animal is going to starve if they can't eat animals or mm -hmm. meat. But, you know, again, when we're saying meat, they're eating the whole animal. But humans kind of had this, this, this little special asterisk, you know, this little special power, which was that we had this fallback strategy. And it probably had to do with the fact that we were evolved from primates and that primates were primarily herbivorous. And I spoke with Miki about this on my YouTube video. There are all sorts of adaptations that we had from a primate to a, a human species. And if you look at Australopithecus versus Homo erectus, there were some major changes in the the acidity of the stomach and the length of the gut and the jaw structure. But, you know, the Homo erectus was a very different animal than a primate ancestor, like a bonobo or a chimp, which people believe we are most closely descended from. And so we had these adaptations where we were sort of adapted to have this, this special power where meat became, I would argue, meat became our main source of food and the best source of food, but we still could eat plants without dying during times of scarcity, as we were sort of transitioning from becoming scavengers to being excellent hunters. And, you know, it would always depend on how many of the animals were present in our locale. And Miki also talks about this, that wherever humans went, the large animals eventually were hunted to extinction, mm -hmm, suggesting mm -hmm. that we were hunting them in extreme amounts and that, that the size of the animals was dropping rapidly when humans moved there. And so we were using them as food and they were this 
incredible food source, but we were adapted to eat them, probably ideally adapted to eat them. And we can talk about, like you're saying, the fact that animals represent this incredible bioavailability in the nutrients without any of the toxins found in plants. But during times of starvation, we can eat plants. And this is kind of what we see. And I think people, you know, get confused about this in modern day society. They think, well, there are a lot of people out there, whether they're vegetarian or vegan, eating plants and they're not dropping over dead. How can we be carnivores? And, you know, my response would be, yeah, I think we're facultative carnivores, meaning that some people are probably a little better adapted to eating plants than others. I think some people clearly have major reactions to plants. Some people can tolerate plants to some level, but I believe, and sort of the hypothesis that I put forward is that most, if not all humans on the planet are evolved from people that were primarily eating meat and animals. And that's the ideal food. And if we do that, I bet people who are doing okay on vegetarian diets would even do better. That's sort of the, the postulate, right? So it's quite an interesting, it's quite an interesting idea that um, we can eat foods during times of starvation. And as you and I have talked about offline, you know, I'm not a zealot for the carnivore diet. I think if people want to eat plants from time to time in their life and they enjoy plants, it's totally fine. But I am interested in sort of communicating this idea that animal foods are probably the ideal foods. And especially in people who have health issues, whether they're autoimmune or psychiatric, which I would also argue, which I would argue is also autoimmune, that those are the people who should think, you know, maybe I should get rid of all my plants and see how I feel. For people like you who are functioning really well and totally kicking butt in decathlon Mm -hmm. and are feeling really good, you might be able to tolerate a little bit of plants and it's not a big deal. You know, don't have, don't have an autoimmune disease or anything like that. But for people who are sick or not sleeping well, or really want to optimize their performance or, you know, have an autoimmune issue or have a psychiatric autoimmune issue. Those are the people that I think this could be such an interesting medical intervention for, you know, I'm coming at this from the position of a physician who has seen a lot of people not get better with conventional elimination diets and conventional, what I, well, that's probably a, an oxymoron, but mm-hmm, I was going to say yeah. conventional functional medicine protocols, but I would say mainstream or just, you know, traditional functional medicine protocols. So this idea, this really radical disruptive idea that plants might be causing an issue, I think is something really valuable to suggest here. But yes, I agree with you completely. Animals are the optimal food in my opinion. Well, exactly. And I I pulled up a study too called Major Correlates of Male Height, a study of 105 countries that really displays this because I've always wrestled with this in my head. It's like, well, there's all these people who are doing well on vegetarian diets or people say, oh, look look at the Okinawans and how long they live. And I was always like, oh, I know you have some genetic uh, thoughts on that, which we can talk about in a second, but the height is very correlated to health. And this study is amazing. It has such great data and it shows the most the greatest R values, just a really good linear correlations between this and the health and height and protein and the quality of protein and animal protein. I don't know why more people aren't talking about this study because it shows that it's all in the North. As you go high, you can see the, these graphs that show that how t- the average height in the North where they're eating the most quality animal protein is over six feet. And then you get into these Asian countries in Southeast Asia and India and where they're relying on a lot more rice and wheat and the average height is as low as 160 centimeters, which is five, three, I believe. And, and yes, you're, you're surviving, but you're not thriving. And if you do this for generation after generation, that your height goes down and that, right. We all started from the same people that are home erectus, like you're talking about these early species. So all that change was people went to different environments and ate different diets and had different environmental effects on them. And that changed them into different people with different heights. People will say, oh, well, they're just genetically short. Well, why are they genetically short? It's because of their environment and their food. Yes. I think that we see that. I mean, you see that in South America too, you know, you see this all over the world and it's happening today. You know, people who are living in countries where there's poverty and they can't get access to good animal foods and they're eating generally poor quality food, rice and beans or something that's really devoid of micronutrients and some of the important minerals and cofactors and B vitamins, they, they're they much shorter. So that's a fantastic study. And it's a great illustration of what we're talking about here, that humans and animals, I mean, one of the memes that I created on Instagram was this idea that animals are the multi, the ultimate multivitamin for human, you know, that if you could design the ultimate multivitamin for a human with all the vitamins and all the minerals in the most bioavailable forms, it would be an animal. 
You know, that mm-hmm. is the human multivitamin is eating an animal nose to tail. Nose to tail. Yeah. And, and that's, that's how to get everything that we need as humans. It's incredible. It's a simple equation and it may sound radical to people, but if you look at the nutritional science, it's, it's really not even debatable that as you're suggesting that animals are, have all of the nutrients in more highly bioavailable forms, you know? I mean, it's just science. Yeah. I like to tell people that was like, well, you just look this stuff up. I'm not making this up. This is like just USDA data, which I mean, isn't even great when you can pick apart that as well. But I mean, even their data just shows that it's all there. (laughs) And, and you have a a great quote about there's no, there, there are no nutrients. There are no unique, unique nutrients in plants that we can't get from animals. So that's kind of this idea that the postulates that I would suggest to people, the overarching postulates are that animals are the most ideal source of every nutrient that a human needs to function optimally. I mean, that right there is a pretty radical statement, but I would, I mean, it's part of my mission to help people understand that and to, to show science that illustrates that, that animals are the most optimal source of all of the nutrients that a human needs to be ideal. Like there's just, there's nothing that humans need that is not present in an animal. So the flip side is plants do not provide any unique nutrients for humans. And this gets into the whole plants discussion, which is super fascinating. And I'm sure we'll go down those rabbit holes because people will say, people will say, what about, um, what about fiber? What about polyphenols? What about micronutrients in plants? And we can address all of those individually. I think first we should just Let's just dwell for a moment on, we talked about a little bit on the fact that like everything is present in animals, you know, and maybe, maybe at the end we can talk about, you know, where the different pieces of nutrition are found in an animal. But this Mm kind of goes back to this idea of eating nose to tail. And my conceptualization of the way that our ancestors would have eaten animals was not just meat, you know, steaks are delicious, but there's no anthropologic evidence that we just ate those steaks. You know, you, you don't, I mean, we, we can't really prove this, but I am in indigenous cultures that are living on the planet now. There's not a single culture that just kills an animal and eats the back strap, you know, like the tenderloin. They're like, oh, I'm just going to eat the ribeye. They go for the liver, they eat it raw, then they get the brain and they get all the organs first. And then they, they know that they can preserve the muscle. And that's like the least valuable thing. And they're, like you said, they're hunting fat animals. So they want fat and organs, whether it's brain or eyeballs, it sounds gross, brain or eyeballs or liver or kidneys or heart. I mean, heart's basically muscle meat, but they want the organs. And though that's what I'm talking about with a carnivorous diet. And it almost needs to be rebranded or renamed into something like nose to tail carnivore or like mm-hmm. a, 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 an ancestral carnivore diet. But, and it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, and it's a little bit of a historical disconnect to think, oh, that's right. Like an animal is not just made out of steak. <laughs> an animal is made out of bones and connective tissue and organs and there's all this nutrients that are uniquely found in different parts of the animal. Perhaps we'll talk about that at the end, but that's my idea with eating animals is that we want to eat nose to tail to get all of the pieces of the animal with all the unique nutrients. There are different compartments of nutrients in different parts of the animal. And when we do that, we both mirror what our ancestors were doing and create like this very incredible multivitamin, this really rich nutrient source without any of the plant toxins. And that, that leads us maybe into the plant discussion. You know, Mm -hmm. the corollary there is, so I'll just restate it for people that animals provide all of the nutrients that a human needs to function optimally in the most bioavailable forms in the proper nutrient ratios without any of the anti-nutrients found in plants. So yeah, let's transition and um, we can yeah, talk yeah. about plants. Talk because about I plants because as a precursor, sorry, it's just people always just yeah, they just say you need plants for this. You need right. plants for the flavonoids. You need this. So why right. do we not need those? Right. So let's talk about it. So the I, like I was said, the objections I hear are mainly threefold. They say you need plants for fiber, you need plants for vitamins and minerals, and you need plants for polyphenols or polyphenols have some unique effect in plants. So let's address each of those sequentially. Okay. Yeah. 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 So if we start with fiber, this is quite an interesting story. Um, I believe the fiber story began with a guy named Burkett. He compared the pattern of diseases in African hospitals to Western diseases. And I believe this was in the 1950s and 60s. So The story of fiber begins with a guy named Dennis Burkett, who was a surgeon in the 1950s and 1960s. And he went to Africa 
Tanzania, I believe. And there he described um, something called Burkitt's lymphoma, which doesn't have to do with fiber. But then he also noticed that people in Africa did not have the same incidence of diverticulosis that people in Britain had at the time. And he was very curious about this and he tried to understand what was going on as any, you know, curious physician would. Now, diverticulosis is a condition of the formation of blind loops in the colon where the mucosal layer outpouches, you know, pushes out through the, the submucosal layer pushes out through the muscularis mucosa, forming these blind pouches. They're called diverticuli. And it's, they're often asymptomatic. They're quite present. They're very common in the population. I think above the age of 50 years old, something like 60 to 70% of the population has diverticulosis, which is the formation of these blind sort of little pouches in the colon. It's not a good mm-hmm. thing because the, these pouches can be um, the source of lower GI bleeding, which can be quite um, life-threatening, or they can become sort of full of food matter and occluded at the sort of base of the diverticulum and form diverticulitis, which is a condition where the whole diverticulum sort of gets walled off. It forms pus and it's like a little mini appendix. So you can get, and that's basically the way that people can think of diverticuli is all these appendices. You know, we have an appendix at the, at the you know, in the lower right quadrant and that's in the cecum and it's this, you know, probably vestigial structure that may have some uh, immunologic function with these pyres patches, but, and that's a blind tube. And so when the appendix gets stuffed up with things, or if the appendix get closed off at the base, it forms appendicitis, which is when it gets kind of swollen and infected and full of pus. Well, these little diverticuli can do the same thing. And so this incidence of diverticulosis was being noted in Britain at the time. And Burkitt went to Africa and saw that people there didn't have the same amount of diverticulosis that people in Britain did. And he thought, what is going on here? What is the difference in what people in Africa are doing. And they were doing a lot of things differently, but we now know in retrospect that he mistakenly thought that it had to do with fiber. They were eating a lot of fibrous foods and he described these, you know, very large bowel movements they were having. And he thought, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. It's fiber. It's all of the fiber in their diet that is protecting them from, um, that is protecting them from diverticulosis. But what's the problem here? The problem is that when we have studied this in the West, it doesn't seem to be the case at all. And I think that this is where people might start to really have their minds blown. Because if you go to your doctor and you have diverticulosis, they're going to tell you to eat a high fiber diet. Because Mm -hmm. unfortunately, most of the physicians in this country don't understand the research and they don't understand that this isn't the case, that there is no evidence to suggest that fiber protects against diverticulosis, as Burkitt suggested. It's sort of an old fairy tale that's been very hard to correct. And there's actually some studies that would suggest the reverse. There is a study from 2012 in the journal Gastroenterology. The title of the study is A High Fiber Diet Does Not Protect Against Asymptomatic Diverticulosis. This was a study of 2,100 participants, and they all had colonoscopy from 1998 to 2010, And so with the colonoscope, they looked for the presence of diverticuli, and they then did a survey to see how much fiber people were eating in their diet. And the results were kind of shocking to the researchers, and this study is from 2012, so it's not that old, um, but it's fairly recent. And the idea was that the more fiber people were consuming by quartile, it tracked, the more diverticulosis someone had, which is completely Mm -hmm. counter to what people were thinking. So not only does fiber not have a protective against effect against diverticulosis it's in this study there's a harmful association now again this is the epidemiology this is a cohort study and we're just looking at an observed finding and then we're doing a um we're doing a a survey so we can't say that the fiber causes diverticulosis but it's pretty clear that the presence of fiber wasn't protective against diverticulosis, as people would suggest. It's a so. Negative correlation, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, and well, same with constipation, right? The, the oh, less yeah. people, the less fiber people ate, the better yeah. There, there are some amazing studies with constipation, so I'll just cite another one because I love to just talk about fiber and poop. You know, mm-hmm. this one is 2013 clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. Constipation and a low fiber diet are not associated with diverticulosis. So this is a little bit different than what you were saying, but this was a cross-sectional study. It was colonoscopy based. 
neither constipation nor a low fiber diet was associated with an increased risk of diverticulosis. So this one again sort of puts the another nail in the coffin that fiber is protective against diverticulosis because a low fiber diet was not associated with diverticulosis. And they said constipation was not associated with diverticulosis. And then the one study that you're referring to is a really interesting study. This one is called Stopping or Reducing Dietary Fiber Intake Reduces Constipation and Its Associated Symptoms. And in this study, it's a small study, it's from 2012, there were 47 patients, oh, excuse me, uh, 16 male, 47 female. So there were uh, a little more than... Um, 60 patients in the study, and they they split them into three groups. There was a no fiber group, a zero fiber group, a reduced fiber group, and a regular diet, right? And these were all people mm-hmm. who had idiopathic constipation. So there were 63 cases of idiopathic constipation. So there was a zero fiber group, a low fiber group, and a regular diet. And what did they find? The group with no fiber had 100% reduction in constipation, gas, and bloating. So every single person in that arm of the trial had resolution of their symptoms, mm-hmm. had complete resolution. So when they had zero fiber, they had resolution in their constipation, gas, and bloating. So this kind of gets to the idea that fiber for some people is definitely causing what's termed small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. So fiber is probably contributing to SIBO in some people. And SIBO can either be methane or hydrogen producing organisms. The methane producing organisms in SIBO are known to sort of be associated with constipation because the uh, methane is a paralytic for the gut. Oftentimes, hydrogen producing SIBO will cause diarrhea. So this perhaps is the root of IBS diarrhea versus IBS constipation. But um, the idea here was that in people with constipation, completely eliminating fiber led to complete resolution of their symptoms. And when I see people in clinic or I see people, private clients, and they have bad constipation, I always recommend this to them. And the way I recommend it is is a carnivorous diet, which doesn't have any fiber. And it's often hard for them to get their head around this. Wait a minute. My doctor said that constipation was caused by not enough fiber, but that doesn't seem to be what we see in the literature at all. There are plenty of other studies that show that fiber doesn't improve constipation. And this study would show completely the opposite, that when you mm-hmm. remove fiber completely, the constipation goes away. So it's just this wild, like, again, we're just shifting paradigms here. Everything is getting turned on its head. No benefit in diverticulosis, potential harm, no benefit in constipation, clear indication that it could be harming in constipation. And then we can, yeah, we can talk about all the other stuff with fiber too, cancer and all this other stuff as well. Well, we, we can go in a little further, but it's just so backwards. People just can't figure this out. And we were obsessed with fiber for like 30, 40 years, it seems like the whole... And, and so many people are obsessed with like how big the bowel movement is, or it's like, oh, the bigger, the better. It's like, it's, it's you're finding kind of the opposite too with the carnivorous diet. It, it's smaller. It's like your body's using all of the nutrients actually. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. So, I mean, I suppose everybody kind of likes talking about poop in general. It's like this voyeuristic thing, but you know, <laughs> like you can eat, you know, a pound, two pounds, of meat a day, which is quite a lot of meat volumetrically. And you're the stool you produce is a fraction of the size of that. You know, it's mm-hmm. just, it, it, you use most of what's in the meat and a lot of what's actually excreted in stool is bacteria. And we know this about stool, you know, poop is actually the majority of poop, or I can't say the majority. I don't know actually what the percentage is of poop that's mm-hmm. stool, that stool. I don't know what the percentage of stool is that is bacteria, but there is some large percentage of the actual poop you know, the log yeah, yeah. for lack of a less technical term, <laughs> that is, that is actual bacteria that are being excreted from your stomach. And there are some fibers, but most of what's in meat and animal foods gets digested. So yeah, it's this fascinating idea. You know, when I was hanging out with Ben Greenfield, he was saying, oh, I, he was eating sort of a, a pseudo carnivorous diet, which I'll commend him for. I don't think he'd committed completely. He was going mm-hmm. to, and I haven't heard the results of his full carnivore experiment, but he was saying, oh, my poops have really changed there. I don't see all the plant fiber. And I think I mean, this gets to be kind of gross to suggest to people, but I think most of us have probably done it, whether we're willing to admit it or not. You know, if you look at your poop, when you're eating plants, you will see the plants in your poop, you know, like Mm -hmm. a lot of the Mm -hmm. plant fibers, whether it's almonds or, I mean, quinoa is the worst or, you know, leafy vegetables or whatever, you will see that in your poop. You know, your poop has green stuff in it. You know, you're not digesting plants, but if you 
if I eat a steak or I eat animal foods, it's just all brown. You know, it's homogeneous mm. and brown. You don't see the steak. There's no, like undigested parts of steak in my poop. So that's probably enough discussion of the way my poop Yeah, goes. well, that's funny because the vegans will say the opposite. They'll say that the meat takes so long to digest, it digest and it putrefies in your stomach. And this is why it, it causes cancer. So you can lead to, you're about to talk about cancer and fiber. So Yeah, yeah. So there's, a, there's two sort of parts of that discussion. The first is whether... Um, fiber is beneficial for cancer. And then the second is whether meat causes cancer of the gut. And we can address mm -hmm. both of those. Staying on the fiber train, um, I think that um, I will just tell people that there is a large amount of data to suggest that there is no benefit to fiber in uh, colonic uh, cancer or colonic adenomas um, or colorectal adenomas. So I mean, I'll, I'll mention a few studies here that are all negative, but um, they're pretty striking. And I think that just so people know what we're talking about, this would be the, the hypothesis that eating more fiber protects you against cancer or precursor lesions for colon cancer, which are known as adenomas. Uh, most colon or colorectal cancer is, you know, an adenoma cancer. Um, and so... One study, most of these are from the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, people will know, a quite highly regarded journal, Dietary Fiber and the Risk of Colorectal Cancer and Adenoma in Women. That's in the New England Journal from, 2000, from, excuse me, from uh, uh, 1999. And they said, after adjustment for age, established risk factors, we found no association between the intake of dietary fiber and the risk of colorectal cancer. The relative risk for the highest as compared to the lowest quintile with respect to fiber was 0.95. No protective effect of dietary fiber was observed when we omitted adjustment for total energy intake. Um, so there was no protective benefit to fiber in women or adenoma recurrence in that study. Um, there have been interventional studies where they have given people a higher fiber diet. So this is also from the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2000. The title is Lack of Effect of a Low-Fat, High-Fiber Diet on the Recurrence of Colorectal Adenomas. This is called the Polyp Prevention Trial Study Group. So conclusion, adopting a diet that is low in fat and high in fiber, fruits, and vegetables does not influence the recurrence of colorectal adenomas. I mean, I, I'm sure that maybe there are jaws on the floor as I'm reading this, you know, or minds, <laughs> I hope there are minds being blown right now. Like, it, it just reminds me of like the, you know, the the book that Ken Berry's written, it's such a great title, you know, lies my doctor told me. And it's like, mm, yeah. like wait a minute, <laughs> or, or lies, lies I heard on MSNBC or lies I heard in the popular press. Like, so I'll, I'll just at the risk of, you know, being um, arduous here, another study, lack of effect of a high fiber cereal supplement on the recurrence of colorectal adenomas, the Phoenix Colon Cancer Prevention Physicians Network. This is New England Journal 2000. As used in this study, a dietary supplement of wheat bran fiber does not protect against colorectal adenomas uh, that are recurrent. And um, these are not small studies. So I think each of these studies had, I believe the first study, I can tell you the number, but this study had 1,400 uh, men and women. And mm -hmm. the previous study had, um, I will bring it up here again, so people know the, the, the magnitude of these studies, the lack of effect of a low fat, high fiber diet had 1900 people in it. And then the first study that I mentioned, um, the women and colon cancer was a huge study. This, um, had 88,700 women, um, oh in it. God. So these are not small studies. You know, I did mention a study earlier that had 63 participants with constipation, but now we're talking thousands of people. Um, I'll go a little further down the fiber, uh, rabbit hole here, which is quite interesting. So this is from the Lancet in 2000, and this is 665 patient study. The title is calcium and fiber supplementation in the prevention of colorectal adenoma recurrence, uh, randomized intervention trial. And they actually said the interpretation was that supplement supplementation with fiber as isphagala husk, which is um, the same species or a similar species to uh, psyllium. This is like Metamucil. Mm -hmm. So supplementation mm -hmm. with fiber as ispagala husk may have adverse effects on colorectal adenoma recurrence, especially in patients with uh, high dietary calcium intake. 
So overall, we know that calcium supplementation is associated with a modest but not significant reduction in the risk of adenoma recurrence. But um, people in the study who had high dietary calcium intake and were given ispagala, so they were given like essentially metamucil, which is commonly prescribed for constipation, they had a higher incidence of colorectal adenoma recurrence. So wait a minute, you know, like fiber not Mm -hmm. only did not benefit people in that study, it worsened it. It worsened it. So, I mean, the the results just go on and on. There is really never been a trial that shows that dietary fiber, whether it's a wheat cereal supplement, whether it's fruit and vegetables in the diet, is protective against colon cancer or protective against precancerous colonic tubular or villous adenomas, you know, these precancerous adenoma lesions. So I think it's pretty clear that fiber is not going to protect against cancer in that respect. It's just, I, I know people are just losing their mind right now. I yeah, hope well, <laughs> well, what about, okay, I had a podcast with Dr. David Clerfeld, which kind of leads into the meat causing cancer discussion because he was on a right. the panel that decided that and was against it and said they were all vegetarian. I know, I think I've read his stuff. <laughs> but um, he, he would, he, on my podcast with him, he brought up that he studied fiber a lot and he thinks, you know, you have to have fiber and that it's there's a mucosal lining and that it protects it. and if it doesn't you don't have any fiber that it, your your the mucosal lining of your intestines are gonna I think it's something about eat, eat itself. Yeah, let's talk about it. So, um, Rhonda Patrick and Stephen Gundry have cited this before, and this kind of bothers me when people talk about this study. So, Rhonda Patrick was on Joe Rogan in the last year or something. And she kind of parroted this information. I'll just say that I respect Rhonda Patrick. I respect her work, but I disagree with her on many things. Mm-hmm. Um, and Stephen Gundry has said this. There's a lot of parroting of this concept that if you don't have fiber, the mucosal lining of your gut will be depleted and your gut will become inflamed and sort of, you know, these sort of pre-inflammatory bowel type uh, phenotype will develop. And so this is all based on one study. And the study was in a very well-respected journal, which is probably why it got so much press. But I just don't think that it really holds up when you look at the study carefully. So the study is from Cell. And the title of the study sounds bad, but we'll dig into it. And then people will understand why I don't think this is convincing at all. And I think it's basically not relevant to humans in any way, shape, or form. So the title of the study is a dietary fiber deprived gut microbiota degrades the colonic mucus barrier and enhances pathogen susceptibility. Well, that sounds pretty bad, right? Mm. If you just read the title, you might think, oh, that Science doesn't sound good out. for not yeah. having a lot of fiber, right? Well, this study is done in mice, okay? This is not mm-hmm. a human trial. Mm-hmm. And these mice are raised notobiotic, which means they're raised without any bacteria in their colon. They have a, a sterile gut. And this is just a, this is just an experimental model that's used you know, that, that they can have these notobiotic mice and then they can put into the mice whatever sort of um, whatever sort of gut microbiota they want to put in the mice. So what they put in the mice was a gut microbiome that they called a human-like microbiome, quote unquote. So this is where it starts to get a little contrived in my mind. So the human-like microbiome that they created was 14 species. So, okay, Mm -hmm. now, first of all, we're in mice and they are describing what the human-like microbiome is, right? So this is in the context of a completely fabricated, quote unquote, human-like microbiome consisting of 14 species of bacteria. In your gut, in my gut, we have anywhere between 700 and 1500 different species of bacteria. Mm -hmm. So this is a wildly oversimplified model. The other issue is that the 14 species that they selected were carbohydrate fiber avid bacteria. They were carbohydrate and fiber liking bacteria. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that in the guts of humans, our guts, and this is a little bit of an aside, but there have been studies that show that if you feed people a carnivorous diet, and there's a study I can talk to about that, the gut flora doesn't go away. It doesn't die. We just shift over to bacteria, to a microbiome that can metabolize protein and fat. And we use different short chain fatty acids. We can talk about the short chain fatty acids. But what we know is that there are bacteria in our guts that can deal with protein and deal with fat. And there are other bacteria in our guts that like carbohydrates. And so there's like two different populations or three different populations of bacteria. And we know that the diet that we eat is going to affect this radically. So 
the, the study is completely contrived because they are putting in 14 organisms that like fiber, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? They're not using a protein based or, you know, mm -hmm. they could do a, you could do this experiment in a completely different way and put in a series of bacteria that like protein, right? And, but no, they put in a series of bacteria that like fiber and carbohydrates into these mice. Okay. And it was only 14 bacteria, different species, as opposed to 700 to 1500 in a normal human. And then the craziest part is that when they looked at the histopathology, there were no differences in the actual in the actual gut lining. So what they were looking at was the thickness of the mucus, and then they were looking at the cells of the gut. So this is called the gastrointestinal epithelial cells. And what they found was that there were no changes in the histopathology. That means that, means that when they looked at the actual cells that form the gut lining below the mucus, there was no difference. They did see that in the fiber-loving bacteria groups that were deprived of fiber, the mucus went down. But then the histopathology of the underlying GI epithelial cells was unchanged. So I'll quote you from the study. They said histopathology and body weight measurements over time of mice from the groups with reduced mucus thickness did not reveal changes compared to the mice consuming the fiber-rich diet. So it's basically they're saying there was erosion of the mucus barrier, but there was no disease. There was no sign of inflammation in the gut lining. And then they go on to say the, that the colonized mice experience erosion of the mucus barrier, albeit without overt signs of disease. So there is no evidence that there was real inflammation in the gut lining. The mucus layer went down, but there was no evidence that there was actual um, changes or histopathologic issues in the actual GI mucosal epithelial cells. So they created this fake microbiome mm -hmm. of fiber-loving bacteria. They deprive it of fiber. The bacteria eat the mucus, and that's the end of the story. Oh, my God. You know? It's insane. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't show histopathology changes at the level of the actual mouse intestinal cells. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't even hear about that all these is, details. Wow. Yeah, that is the study that he was quoting. That is the study that Rhonda Patrick quotes. That is the study that Stephen Gundry quotes. And I guarantee that listeners to this podcast will hear this study quoted time and time again. And people will say, you need to eat fiber to have a healthy gut microbiome because of the mucus layer. You know, I was listening to, I just saw on my Instagram the other day, David Perlmutter was talking to Mark Hyman, and he said the same thing. I mean, the idea that humans need fiber or that fiber is beneficial for humans is so often parroted. It's just crazy. Maybe at this moment, we should take a little brief detour to explain to people why that is probably the notion that is held. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with epidemiology and the differences between healthy user bias, confounded studies, and things like that. Can we talk about that for a moment? Yeah, for people? yeah, yeah. People, people have talked about it. Like Georgia Ede likes to talk about this stuff, but definitely go over it. Well, I think that what people are probably saying in their minds now is, how can it be? You know, there must be some evidence somewhere that suggests that fiber is good for humans. And I would say, yes, there is. And it's epidemiology, mm -hmm. <laughs> meaning it's not an interventional trial. It's epidemiology trials that haven't done anything except follow people over time and do food frequency questionnaire surveys to look at how much fiber our people are eating. Now, at first surface level, you might think, well, that's probably a decent study. You know, if people are healthier and they're eating more fiber, maybe that's a good thing. The problem, if we think about it, is that we're looking at westernized groups of people. And those groups of people have been told subtly, not so subtly for the last 30, 40, 50 years, probably since Burkitt in the 60s, that fiber was crucial. And so people who are eating fiber are also doing other healthy behaviors. And this is what's called healthy user bias. This is the same thing that confounds all of the epidemiology studies of fruits and vegetables. We'll get into this later. But there's this idea that if you look at epidemiology studies with fiber, you see a benefit because people are probably doing other healthy behaviors. It doesn't tell us fiber is beneficial. And if we really dig into the interventional trials, we see no benefit in diverticulosis. We see no benefit in cancer. And we see probably a reduction in constipation, gas, and bloating. So these are completely disparate evidence bases because the epidemiology is probably 
irrevocably, unrescuably confounded by healthy user bias. And I'll just mirror that with the idea that this is the same thing with fruits and vegetables. When we get into fruits and vegetables specifically and the benefits in fruits and vegetables, it's the same problem. The studies which show benefit are epidemiology, which are confounded by healthy user bias. They're not interventional trials, but as a foreshadowing of what will come soon, when we do interventional trials with fruit and vegetables, we do not see a benefit, which is just mind blowing. I mean, it's not mind blowing Mm -hmm. for me anymore, but for most people, when they do interventional trials with fruits and vegetables, no benefit, no change in uh, oxidative stress or DNA damage markers. So we'll get to that. But just with the fiber, I just want to point out to people that when people say there's a benefit to fiber, you need fiber, they're not completely off their rocker. They're just only looking at epidemiology and they're probably not considering all of the evidence here. So this is what's I think most confusing for people in all of these spaces. And I'm constantly having to kind of help people understand this concept that epidemiology is not as valuable as we believe it is because of this healthy user bias and conversely because of an unhealthy user bias. You know, sometimes you can see things like saturated fat being associated with worse outcomes. Well, who eats saturated fat? You know, people that are smoking and drinking and doing unhealthy behaviors because that's, we've been told that's bad forever, right? So it's just, we really have to tease it out. And what we really need are interventional trials. On saturated fat topic, we can talk about the fact that there was a recent, you know, I published something on my Instagram or I noted something on my Instagram that there was, there have been epidemiology studies that show that there's no association with cardiovascular outcomes of saturated fat as well. But that just gets into the confusing issue. Yeah, they even studied the epidemiology and they studied healthy user bias. And they said that people who are eating meat, they're ignoring their doctor's recommendations and they're more likely to smoke, drink, not exercise and all that other stuff. So yes, this, this this itself has been studied. Yeah. So the meat and cancer thing, the WHO statement that meat causes cancer is based on a report from the IARC. And there were probably hundreds of studies that looked at associations between meat and cancer. There's never been an interventional trial between meat and cancer that I'm aware mm-hmm. of. You know, Basically what we're doing with meat and cancer is we're exclusively looking at epidemiology, right? So in the IARC report, they had 15 studies that they chose to include. Of those 15 studies, eight showed no association between meat and cancer. So the majority showed zero association between meat and cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Five or six showed association between meat and cancer that was not statistically significant, right? So a small association, not statistically significant, which gets into kind of this statistical epidemiology stuff saying, well, if there's an association, but it's not statistically significant, we really can't say that this is strong enough to make a judgment. In those 15 studies out of the hundreds that they could have considered, only one showed a statistically significant correlation between meat and colorectal cancer. And if you further look at the analysis, that association between meat and cancer was only present in the people who had metabolic syndrome or had obesity. So the whole thing is based on one study out of 15, the majority of which showed no association, six of which showed some association, but not statistically significant. And one which showed a statistically significant association, none of which stratified for processed meat versus non-processed meat that I'm aware of. And the association between meat and cancer was really only present in people with metabolic syndrome in the one study. So to me, it's such a misunderstanding. And this is where we go wrong with all this stuff is this idea that like, wait a minute, that's what's been held up as the guideline. And then if you actually look at the, at the power, it's like 1.18, which is just a, a laughable number. I mean, that sort of an odds ratio is just not even usable in statistics. I mean, we look at smoking and things like this and the odds ratios are like 10. It's 10, yeah, it's like 10 to 30 that showed us that smoking. And so 1.18 means that there's an 18% increase. Like that is within the realm of statistical error. So people need to understand that even in the one study that showed association out of 15, that was statistically significant, that was really only significant in the people who had metabolic syndrome, which is itself a risk factor for cancer, because we know that hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance is a strong risk factor for cancers of all types. And the association that came out of it, the odds ratio was 1.18, which is just crazy. That's within the realm of statistical yeah, not, error. 
So then we look at other things that we make decisions on and that we never make a decision based on a, a 1.18. So, and then if you just back up and you think about it, what is the mechanism by which meat causes cancer? Like, and that's, I think where people, that's another thing we can dive into, you know, talking about, well, it's the heme iron or it's the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And I, I'm happy to talk about all of those things, but, um, if we just return briefly to our original discussion, which is this fascinating idea of anthropology, it just doesn't make intuitive sense that something that we have been eating for the majority of our evolution as humans would cause us colon cancer. That would have been selected out long yeah. ago, you know? And this is a little bit of an appeal to, you know, logic, and it's a little bit of an appeal to sort of the basis of natural selection. But when People will say like, well, that those animal products can't be good for you. I think we have been eating them for 1.8 million years or more, you know, certainly within the last 70 to 80,000 years during which natural selection was alive and well. If, if meat really caused heart disease or if meat really caused colon cancer, those people, that gene would have had a strong pressure to get selected out of the population. We, we've adapted around these foods, I believe. Absolutely. And well, even you're just talking about the people with the metabolic disease too, or just in general, that the people who are eating the high, the meat diets or they're eating it with processed foods and carbs and sugar and all this other stuff. Exactly. I mean, so it's like no one's been studied that's just eating a carnivorous diet or a, even just a healthy paleo diet or anything where it's in a healthy context. Exactly. It's so funny because there are studies now done on people eating vegan diets you know, sponsored by the American Heart Association or paid for through the NIH, but there are no NIH funded studies that I'm aware of on paleo diets. I think they're starting to, I believe Cordain might've gotten a few small mm -hmm. ones funded, but yeah, that's, this is the kind of the meme, you know, don't blame the meat for what the bread did. And that gets back to the epidemiology and the unhealthy user bias that if people are eating more meat, they're also eating it with bread and other processed foods. And we have to be very careful where we sort of tease out what was causing um, the problem here. And if we just appeal to evolution and logic, we think, wait a minute, we've been eating these foods forever. Like why, why? would this basic unprocessed food be so bad for us? Yeah. Like that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't, that's just that, that defies logic and it just defies sort of this notion of what we thought of as evolution and natural selection. And that doesn't make any sense to me. So yeah. Um, yeah so meat and cancer in my mind, is, is a fallacy. And then perhaps the most interesting piece of this equation are some of the studies looking at Asia. And when we go outside of the US and we look at incidents of um, cancer and connections with meat in Asian countries, we see something completely different than the West, um, probably because of these healthy user biases that we are so subject to in the Western world, this idea that if you go to Asia, in Asia, meat is seen as, as a luxury food, mm -hmm. right? And so it's associated with success. And what do we see in Asia? I'm going to try and find a study for you. I'm failing to find it at this moment, but um, here it probably is over here. Okay. So in Asia, if we look at the connections between, or we look at the correlation between meat and cancer, it's completely different. So this study is the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, 2013, meat intake and cause specific mortality, a pooled analysis of Asian prospective cohort studies, ecological data inc indicate an increase in meat intake in Asian countries. However, our pooled analysis did not provide evidence for a higher risk of mortality for total meat intake and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat, poultry, fish, and seafood. <laughs> Red meat intake was inversely associated with cardiovascular mortality in men and with cancer mortality in women in Asian countries. What a mind, yeah. like just, just challenging. The more so, meat they ate, the, the better off they were. Yep. The more meat men ate, the less cardiovascular disease they had. The more meat women ate, the less cancer they had. So red meat and cancer, no, I don't buy it. Yeah. So it's just a crazy story. So yeah, there's no evidence that meat causes cancer. There's no evidence that fiber is beneficial for cancer. And, you know, there's no evidence that fiber is beneficial for any of these other things, diverticulosis, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you want to talk about mm -hmm. next? You want to talk about polyphenols? Yeah, let's go back to these plant foods because so many people prop these up. You need these antioxidants from plants. You need, there's so many polyphenols, flavonoids, this and that. Just dive into that because that's going to blow people's mind. 
So this is this starts to get really interesting, and I think people are really going to be surprised when they learn many of these um, learn many of these issues. So the the thinking is that polyphenols have some benefit from plants because now we've talked about fiber. We can easily talk about the micronutrients in, in plants. I think if people just look at nutrition and they read the studies, they will find very quickly that there really are no micronutrients, that is vitamins or minerals in plants that we cannot get in better quantities in more highly bioavailable forms in animals. So we're talking about iron, we're talking about selenium, we're talking about magnesium, we're talking about all the B vitamins, we're talking about you know the fact that vitamin A is beta carotene in plants and it's retinol vitamin A in animals. It's much more absorbable. The fact that most of the minerals in plants are chelated to phytic acid. And so they're very poorly absorbed. So even though people say there's tons of magnesium in almonds, you're not going to absorb hardly any of it. And if you eat things with phytic acid, you're going to absorb less of the other minerals you are eating in the same meal. So the fact that the idea that plants provide any of the micronutrients in a valuable way, I think is fairly easily dismissed if people just look at the nutritional science. And the one thing that might come up there that I'll talk about briefly before I get into the polyphenols is vitamin C. And I did a uh, video on my channel on YouTube that I would refer people to on this with Bart K. And basically the idea with vitamin C is that when you look at how much vitamin C a human needs, it is much less than what we were being told and high doses of vitamin C are likely dangerous for us. There was a study done in, uh, this is actually uh, the, using the data from World War II, they had conscientious objectors. And um, this is actually a quite fascinating study. And the title of the study is uh, Medical Experiments Carried Out in Sheffield on Conscientious Objectors to Military Service During the 1939 to 1945 War. During this, in this series of experiments, they gave some of these conscientious objectors scurvy. Mm -hmm. It took them, I think, six to eight months to develop scurvy on a zero vitamin C diet. And they did a series of experiments, which were mirrored in other places throughout the world, where they looked to see how much vitamin C was needed to reverse scurvy. And it was 10 milligrams, 10 milligrams a day oh or less. And this is just crazy. So the idea with vitamin C is that we probably need vitamin C. The, one of the main roles that we know we need vitamin C for is to do the hydroxylation reaction in the formation of collagen. So collagen is built as a peptide, meaning it's many amino acids, and it, it's generally a repeating series of amino acids, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. And one strand of amino acids is joined to two more strands to form a triple helix. There is a hydroxylation reaction and then a glycosylation reaction of those strands to form the triple helix. Vitamin C participates in the first step where the collagen strand is hydroxylated. So when we see what scurvy is, is absence of proper formation of collagen. And this is what we need the vitamin C molecule for. And a very, very small amount of vitamin C is necessary for us to do this every day. And that is an amount easily obtainable in animal foods, provided they are fresh and not overcooked. Meaning maybe half a pound, a pound of meat is going to have 10 to 15 milligrams of vitamin C. And if you look at liver, liver has about 30 milligrams of vitamin C in three ounces. So if people had even a pound of fresh meat a day and a little bit of liver, they would get plenty of vitamin C to meet all their requirements to make collagen molecule totally strong and healthy. One of the things they say in this study that I think is particularly interesting is that they could not find any difference in the health of people um, once they had corrected the scurvy. So what they're saying is there's no evidence that more vitamin C than that has any benefit. Mm. So they say um, no differences were found in the Sheffield study in the health of those receiving 70 milligrams a day compared with the group that receiving 10 milligrams a day. And Jacob, which is one of the authors, could find no biological or physiological markers to indicate a condition of vitamin C deficiency in the absence of signs of clinical scurvy. So with regard to scurvy, with regard to vitamin C, everyone wants to say the more vitamin C, the better. It's an antioxidant. This is probably not the way it works. I think that the vitamin C hypothesis is going to get challenged in the next few years. We know we need a very small amount of vitamin C. It might even be less than 10 milligrams just to do the collagen reaction. And if you absolutely restrict vitamin C to levels of zero, you will get scurvy. Mm -hmm. But that's probably 
the main role of vitamin C, it participates in a few other reactions in the body, but we don't need 300, 400, 1,000 milligrams. In fact, if you look at vitamin C specifically, I would refer people to that video, the higher doses of vitamin C have often been associated with toxicity. Even doses of 1,000 milligrams, which is the commonly prescribed dose of vitamin C, has been associated with increased levels of oxalates, nausea, diarrhea, all sorts of problems, and potentially um, oxidation of vitamin B12 leading to lower levels of bioavailable B12. So that is just the discussion, mm. I would say, about plant nutrients. They're not bioavailable. They're there a little bit. We can use them as survival foods, but all the nutrients we are need are found in the mm. right bioavailable forms, in the most bioavailable forms in animals. Well, and with vitamin C, don't you need less of it if you're not eating a bunch of processed carbs and sugar as well? Is it because it compete with the same pathways? Yes. So this is the glucose ascorbate antagonism theory. It's not fully worked out, but there are some people who believe this. It seems possible that a lot of things are a little bit different in our physiology and biochemistry when we're not eating carbohydrates. When we're in ketosis, yeah. The idea is that perhaps vitamin C and glucose compete for the same transporter in, in various parts of the body, whether it's red blood cells or other places like that, and that when you're not eating um, glucose, perhaps you can do with less. But in this study, you know, they gave, they, they were giving people 10 milligrams of vitamin C in the context of a high carbohydrate diet. You know, we can sort of tell that no benefit there. So well, you, okay. let's move on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to move on to the polyphenols? Yeah. Yeah. Polyphenols. So polyphenols, what are polyphenols? Polyphenols are polyphenolic compounds. They are complex molecules that have an aromatic benzene ring in them. Phenol is a benzene ring and a hydroxyl group, if people are familiar with organic chemistry, so they can look up, you know, a polyphenolic molecule. These molecules generally exist in plants. And if we look at them, they are often plant defense mechanisms because they create oxidative stress. So this gets into a little bit of some general chemistry, but the reason polyphenols are used as defense molecules by plants is because they are oxidatively reactive, meaning they can participate in oxidation reduction reactions. So what am I describing here? Oxidation is a process of loss of electrons. Reduction is a process of a gain of electrons. So when I was talking about early in the podcast about electrons being the currency of life and we're eating molecules for electrons, this is totally true. It's all about giving and taking of electrons and all throughout our lives, every day in our body, molecules are getting oxidized and reduced. Electrons are getting passed around. Well, there are things that can happen called free radicals. And a free radical is when a molecule is usually it's um, oxidized, so it loses an electron, meaning that the two paired electrons in an orbital become one unpaired electron. It loses an electron, a molecule becomes oxidized, and it forms a free radical, meaning it has this unpaired electron, which is very reactive at a biochemical level. That is a free radical. That can participate in oxidative reactions with other molecules, and it can either donate to other molecules or pull electrons from other molecules, oxidizing them. Now, this is exactly what polyphenolic molecules do. They have a number of electrons in these sort of uh, the groups of the benzene ring, and those electrons are sort of unpaired. They are looking to pull electrons from other molecules or donate those electrons to other molecules. So that is what it means to be polyphenolic. That is what it means for the molecule to have an oxidative ability. Now, why do we say these molecules are beneficial for us? The, the hypothesis, what has been shown in the research is that molecules that are polyphenolic often trigger our own antioxidant defenses, and this is why they're considered to be beneficial. This gets into the concept of hormesis, mm -hmm. the idea that a small amount of a poison can be good for humans, which is a concept that I would completely agree with. We see this illustrated every day in our daily lives, and as I will illustrate with some studies, we can undergo a process of hormesis naturally with exercise, with cold stress, with heat stress like a sauna. UV light is a hormetic. A small amount of exercise we know is good for us. It's good for us because it provides endogenous oxidative stress. When you exercise, more free radicals are produced in the cellular energy factories of the mitochondria. When more free radicals are produced, your body activates a system called the NRF2 system. And that tells your body to produce more glutathione, which is our own endogenous antioxidant. That is our molecular policeman. Glutathione is this magical molecule, which is also three amino acids, different amino acids than the collagen. 
glutathione is cysteine, glutamine, and glycine. And we'll come back to the importance of glycine yes, later, but glycine is present. Glycine is present in both collagen and glutathione. That's a very important amino acid. But glutathione is our master antioxidant, meaning glutathione is this magical molecule that can go around being the molecular policeman saying, hey, you're a free radical, you're acting up, I'm going to give you an electron. So glutathione gives an electron to that molecule. It makes it not a free radical anymore. It calms it down. And then there are other pathways in our body, glutathione reductase, glutathione peroxidase, that then give the electron back to glutathione. Okay. So glutathione can donate molecules, donate electrons, excuse me, to other molecules to reduce them and make them less reactive. That's what glutathione does. So in our daily lives, if we go for polar plunge, if we exercise, we are creating free radicals and our body increases our own glutathione. Okay. What happens when we eat polyphenols? When you eat polyphenols, you have this exogenous oxidative stress. You have this exogenous Essentially, polyphenols are like free radicals. You're getting a small amount of molecules that can create free radicals, and your body kind of does the same thing. It goes, whoa, oxidative stress. The NRF2 pathway turns on, you increase your glutathione, and you get this, you get this hormetic response, right? So this is what people would argue with molecules like sulforaphane. Technically, sulforaphane is not a polyphenol, but it's still one of these plant molecules that people say is very beneficial, and it's acting through the same pathway, so I'll lump it in there. Polyphenolic molecules are things like curcumin or resveratrol, right? Yeah, yeah. and just to jump in, just to make sure people who might be new to this, endogenous, he's talking about the glutathione, that's from our body makes it, an exogenous, that's from an outside source. Yes, so when I say endogenous antioxidant, it means that is something that we make exogenous, it's coming from outside of us. It's foreign. So one of the things I've talked about with regard to plants is that there are no molecules in plants that participate in our endogenous biochemistry. Plants and animals, plants and humans, or plants and animals are two different operating systems. We are like Mac and they are like PC. You can tell my bias there, right? The, the, the codes don't mix. So we don't use plant molecules in our endogenous biochemistry. I think there's this misconception in popular culture that sulforaphane somehow participates in our body and directly acts as an antioxidant. That's completely false. Sulforaphane does not run around your body and donate electrons to anyone. If anything, sulforaphane runs around your body creating oxidative stress. So sulforaphane is a bad actor in the body and your body goes and cleans it up and gets a hormetic response and increases your glutathione. Well, if people are listening to that, that is the postulated mechanism for curcumin. We can talk about curcumin as well, but curcumin is a little different molecule. But these molecules that are polyphenolic are supposed to be beneficial because they induce hormetic oxidative stress. Now, the first problem is that that means that they are poisonous. They are oxidative molecules. If you get too much they can be frankly toxic because you can definitely exceed your body's ability to detoxify these molecules. The second thing that happens with these is that because they're from a different operating system, they do other bad things in the human body besides inducing glutathione. So I would argue, yes, getting a little bit of hormetic benefit from sulforaphane is great. However, and this is the important point, that is not something we need sulforaphane for. We can achieve optimal antioxidant status without any of these plant molecules and then we don't have any problem with the other bad things these molecules do because they are foreign to our bodies. Mm -hmm. In the case of sulforaphane, it's known to do many other dangerous things in our bodies. One of the most striking is to compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid directly, creating problems with thyroid hormone production. So you can definitely give yourself hypothyroidism. You can create a hypothyroid state by eating too many broccoli sprouts. And any amount of broccoli sprouts with these isothiocyanate molecules, which is a family of molecules of which sulforaphane is one, will compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid. So these molecules are inhibiting normal thyroid hormone production. They are from a different operating system. They have toxicities outside of this hormetic benefit. And this is what's not being talked about in the popular press because supplement companies want to sell you broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. They want to sell you sulforaphane. So it's just like the spotlight on the good thing. And nobody's talking about all the bad effects that these things have other places because they are foreign to our bodies. It's like a virus. It's like a computer virus, right? It's going to do one thing to kind of sneak in, but then it's going to cause havoc in other places. And I would argue these molecules are a net negative and there are no unique benefits, this but I'll just, I'll just refresh. I'll just recap there. The reason polyphenols are supposed to be beneficial is because of these hormetic effects, but we don't need them to achieve optimal antioxidant status, and they always 
come with negative side effects because they're a different operating system. And we can enumerate those with different molecules. And I can show you, this is what this molecule does that's bad for us, even though it might have a hormetic effect. Yeah, this is blowing people's minds because I already know this. I've already heard it from you and I it, it's crazy. And people like Rhonda Patrick, they, she goes on Joe Rogan and Joe doesn't know all this stuff. And she seems like a genius hero telling everyone to eat broccoli sprouts and no one's talking about the uh, this side of things. Right. And so let's talk a little bit about endogenous, the endogenous ability to make antioxidants and why we don't need sulforaphane to be healthy. So I posted on my Instagram about this and got a lot of attraction and people engaged today. And what I did, what I posted on my Instagram today, I guess this won't come up on the day, this won't be released mm -hmm. on the day that I posted it, but I've posted I've posted case studies, or at least I've posted stories of people that have texted me and said, hey, I was doing stuff with Rhonda Patrick, or I was listening to her advice and doing broccoli spouts. My thyroid got completely messed up. My gut got completely messed up. And then I stopped and I'm so much better. And I just, I appreciate that because I really, I respect her as an individual and I respect her work, but I think many of her recommendations are myopic and they're wrong and they're hurting people. Mm -hmm. And so- what she is saying about sulforaphane is she is citing all of the studies which show that there is less DNA damage when you take sulforaphane. And the reason there is less DNA damage is that there is an increase in our endogenous glutathione. So it is not the sulforaphane doing it directly. It is not a unique effect of sulforaphane. It is the glutathione. Well, here's the problem with this. And this is what I was saying. We don't need sulforaphane to increase our glutathione. We don't need sulforaphane to have a net glutathione benefit. We don't need sulforaphane to have optimal antioxidant status in our bodies. So I'll just illustrate this with a study, um, uric acid and glutathione levels during short-term whole body cold exposure. This is a really fascinating study from 1992. And this was a study of two things. It was a study of the uric acid levels and the glutathione levels of cold water swimmers in Berlin. So these people are wild. They swim for an hour in cold water in the winter in Berlin. And this is like cold exposure, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is like cold hormesis. And what they find in these people is that after they swim in the water for an hour, they have increased levels of oxidative stress and the glutathione levels go down. The glutathione gets oxidized, meaning the glutathione is being used up to get rid of these oxygen radicals that are formed with this hormetic stress of cold exposure, right? Then what happens? Then they get an increase in glutathione after the fact because their NRF2 pathway turns on and they make a little more glutathione in an adaptive way. This is hormesis. Mm -hmm. But I think this is an amazing illustration that living a normal radical life, just being exposed to cold stress, you know, whether it's a cold plunge or a cold shower or a sauna or even exercise, like I said, exercise does all of these same things. Exercise activates the NRF2 pathway in the same way. Mm -hmm. We can achieve hormesis without sulforaphane. We don't need the molecule. And as I mentioned, the problem with sulforaphane that Ron Patrick's not talking about, that no one in the industry is talking about, is that it's going to mess up people's thyroids in addition to other things. You can, I believe, you can easily eat too many broccoli sprouts and create excess oxidative stress on your body. You can completely overwhelm your body's ability to get rid of the oxidized, to, excuse me, you can completely overwhelm your body's ability to get rid of the sulforaphane as an oxidant, and then the sulforaphane will run around your body as a free radical, creating excess oxidative stress. And there are studies that show that sulforaphane will cause lipids to form lipid peroxides, which are things like 4-HNE, acrolein. These have been shown to be directly toxic to cells, potentially causing inflammation, insulin resistance uh, directly. Those kind of go back to like oxidized omega-6 fatty acids, but sulforaphane is an oxidant, right? This is going to, sulforaphane is going to pull electrons from other molecules and, and oxidize them. And by doing that, it can actually create lipid peroxides, which people will probably be familiar with. And those can be very damaging. So it can be a direct oxidant if you take too much and it's directly toxic to the mm. thyroid. So why do we need it? Why would we even do that when we can just go live a radical life? Like just go jump in a cold lake, exercise, yeah, yeah. do normal things in your life. You don't need it. I mean, other guests have brought this up, but just you, we, you haven't said it yet is that Plants don't want to be eaten. They have all these different systems. Like the sulforaphane is produced because the plant is protecting yes. itself. So just you can go over that real quick. 
Yeah, I love this concept. So you see this pattern in plants all the time. And this goes back to the idea that we probably should have set the stage in the beginning. Plants don't want to get eaten. Plants have the same agenda as humans, which is to, to push your DNA to the next generation. Plants don't exist on this earth to feed humans, despite, you know, the book of Genesis mm -hmm. and like all biblical references, you know, like plants were not created for humans. This is not like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, these are not benign creatures. They, they're not looking to poison us unless we eat them because we're killing them. They definitely don't want us to eat their babies. They don't want us to eat seeds. They don't want us to eat stems and roots and leaves. And we can talk about the fruits. That's a whole different discussion. They're probably just using humans with fruits. I don't believe fruit has any real benefit mm -hmm. for humans either. But plants absolutely do not want to get eaten. And if you dig into it, we haven't even gotten to all of the plant toxins. So I guess we were just setting the stage and saying you don't need plants for fiber. Plants do not have any benefit for micronutrients. The polyphenols are not beneficial from plants. They're probably harmful. And then the, the fourth piece of the equation is plants have a shitload of toxins that we haven't even talked about. And you can definitely see sulforaphane is one of these toxins. So I talked about sulforaphane as an oxidant. Well, sulforaphane is so oxidizing that sulforaphane does not even exist in the plant. It exists as a precursor called glucoraphanin. And we see this in other plants. We see the same pattern, that there's a precursor to a very oxidatively stressful molecule that's held in a precursor form until it combines with an enzyme. And the reason those two combine is when the plant gets chewed. So at no point, in a broccoli or brassicate life plant, at no point in the plant's life as a broccoli or a brassicate plant does sulforaphane exist. Sulforaphane only exists when you chew on the broccoli, mm -hmm. okay? Or when an animal chews on the broccoli. To protect it. Or, yeah. yep. And so the reason it exists is because the enzyme myrosinase combines with glucoraphanin, and then you get sulforaphane. You see the same thing in cassava, in which linamarin combines with linamarinase, to make hydroxycyanic acid. And cassava is this highly toxic root that's used all over Central America that has to be extensively processed so that people don't die from these cyanogenic glycosides that are produced. But the cyanogenic glycosides don't exist in the root because they're so oxidatively stressful. They don't exist in the root. They only exist in the root when you chew it up or when you process it, then you make the toxin. There's a clear evidence here that this is the plant's toxin pattern. It's sort of like I don't know. It's like, um, it's like a puffer fish or something. It's like, Hey, I'm not going to be toxic until you eat me. Maybe puffer fish isn't a great example, but it's like the plant isn't toxic until you squish it all together. You know, it's sort of like, uh, it's like an explosive, you know, it's like dynamite. You have to combine these two things and it, then it makes the really powerful stuff that's going to get you. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like super glue. You have to combine the two pieces of super glue. Then it makes super glue. But so forophane would kill the broccoli plant. It would kill the broccoli plant. It cannot mm -hmm. exist in the broccoli plant. So what does it do? It makes this precursor and it says, okay, I'm going to store it. If you eat me, my rosinase is going to touch glucoraphane and you're going to get sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is a toxin. It's a toxin. So yeah, plants don't want to get eaten and we can get there's, into all there's of these. There's so many examples. Guys. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. other guests have brought it up, but I mean, just quickly, I mean, other animals, if they get stuck in a pasture of eating too much of the same type of plant, they can die or get sick, even if they're even used to and genetically evolved to eat plants, which is another story that you should quickly say is people will say, oh, well, how come, you know, herbivores can handle this? Well, yeah. I mean, herbivores have been doing it their whole life, right? They're clearly co-evolved. They've clearly co-evolved with plants, but you bring up this amazing point. So I've heard Fred Provenza talk about this in a podcast with Ben Greenfield. When goats or sheep or cows are allowed to graze, they don't just eat one plant. They're going to eat 10 or 15 or 20 different plants because they know they have this intrinsic knowledge that they can't eat one plant. If they eat one plant, they're going to get too much of the toxin. These animals have co-evolved with these plants to tolerate a small level of the toxin, and then they can move on to another plant. We've completely lost that idea as humans. We don't know which ones are toxic, which ones are not. They're probably all toxic. Mm -hmm. And we've been hunting for the last 80,000 years. You know, we are hunters. We have not co-evolved with plants. We've only used plants as survival food. But these animals eat plants exclusively, so they have totally different ability to detoxify, to deal with these plant toxins. And they have this sort of intrinsic innate knowledge that, hey, I can only eat a little bit of that and I'm going to get sick and I can only eat a little bit of that. So if they're stuck in one field, they're going to get sick. And then Fred Provenza talks about the fact that if they give cows anti-emetic medications and anti-nausea medications, then they will consume plants 
without knowing that they're getting nauseous and then they'll get really sick, mm. you know? Mm. Um, that if you take away the, the, the cows and sheep and goats, they're clearly getting nauseous. They're getting some sort of a feedback mechanism. Oh, I'm done with that, you know? Well, oh, I'm done with that. I don't need that anymore. It's too toxic for me. And But if you take away that instinct, they'll just have all sorts of problems and it can be a major issue for them. So yeah, I mean, herbivores have co-evolved with the plants and developed mechanisms. We, I would argue, evolved away from plants and that's what allows us to become big brain animals that walk on two legs and can throw spears and hunt animals. And we don't have any of these defense mechanisms anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are some really interesting studies that are interventional with vegetables. And that sounds funny, but there are actually studies in which people have been given vegetables and they control, they have a study group that has vegetables and a study group that doesn't have any vegetables and they can compare all sorts of cardiovascular markers, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to show people some of these studies because nobody hears about these studies and they're just wild. Mm -hmm. And they really, really challenge this notion that, that any of these compounds in vegetables have a unique benefit for humans. And I think that I must, I, I've got to believe that all the researchers who are doing this, just their jaws hit the floor when they get the results and they're like, damn it, this didn't show what we wanted to see. Mm -hmm. But the first one is, the first one is called the effects of high consumption of vegetables on clinical immunological and antioxidant markers in subjects at risk for cardiovascular diseases. Okay. Now this is a four week study. Um, and it was 38 subjects who were at risk for cardiovascular disease. And they had one group, which was low vegetable consumption. So 800 grams of vegetables per week for people that don't know, that's like a little less than two pounds of vegetables per week or high vegetable consumption, which was 4,200 grams of vegetables per week. That's almost 10 pounds. Wow. Uh, of vegetables per week, right? So they had low and high vegetables. And the vegetables were not like what people would consider to be, you know, weenie vegetables. They were carrots, Jerusalem artichoke, tomatoes, cabbage, peppers. And they looked at clinical immunological and antioxidant markers. And what did they see? No significant changes were detected in any of the markers for those with low vegetable versus high vegetable consumption. I think that this is the type of study that people are just like, what? They had people eating 800 versus 4,200 grams of vegetables per week. And there were no differences in the people, like the people that ate 10 pounds of vegetables per week, a month? no benefits. Uh, for, excuse me, for yes. The people that ate 10 pounds of vegetables for a month, no benefit in the oxidative stress markers. This goes back to glutathione, all these no benefit in the immunologic markers, no benefit in the clinical markers. So what is going on here? Well, fruits and vegetables are probably not all they're cracked up to be. We don't need fruits and vegetables for optimal antioxidant status. And this is not the only study of its kind. This is, there's actually been other studies that are even more impressive because that study had people eating 400 grams of vegetables. You could argue and say, all right, all right. Well, maybe, maybe in that study, 800 grams of vegetables a, a month, oh, 800 grams of vegetables per week for four weeks was enough to give them all the benefit, right? Well, that's not the case when we look at other studies. So this next study is no effect of 600 grams of fruit and vegetables per day on oxidative DNA damage and repair in healthy non-smokers. So this is a study that was also similar amount of time. It was a parallel group study um, 24 days, 43 subjects. They had three groups. One had an antioxidant free basal diet and 600 grams of fruits and vegetables per day, which is a little more than a pound. One that had a completely antioxidant free group. So no fruits and vegetables. And one that had a diet with a supplement containing corresponding amounts of vitamin and minerals in the fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And they did blood and urine samples. After four weeks, what did they find? The level of strand breaks in DNA, endonuclease 3 sites, formamidopyrimidine sites, which is a, uh, a surrogate for DNA damage, sensitivity to hydrogen peroxide in mononuclear blood cells, excretion of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, uh, which is a measure of DNA damage, no differences between the groups. Mm. No differences. So... So they said, our results show that after 24 days of complete depletion of fruits and vegetables or daily ingestion of 600 grams of fruits and vegetables or the corresponding amount of vitamins and minerals, the level of DNA oxidative damage was unchanged. <laughs> they go on to say this suggests that the inherent antioxidant defense mechanisms are sufficient to protect circulating mononuclear blood cells from reactive oxygen species, which is what I would argue very strongly. We don't need 
fruits and vegetables to achieve optimal antioxidant status. It's never been shown in any interventional trial. It's just wild. It flies in the well, face. So people are like, well, what am I eating vegetables for? Well, <laughs> and I would argue, I don't know. What are you eating vegetables for? You're just getting a bunch of plant toxins, which we haven't even talked about at this That's point. That's so like, funny. Well, you know, it's great as I was out with this girl from Peru the other night and she was making fun of Americans. She's like, we don't eat vegetables. She's like, broccoli. Like, why would I eat broccoli? Like no one in, she was talking about like the whole South America. I went to Brazil too. They're just, they're eating starches and meat. They, they have like a little bit. They're like, she's like the only, we have a little bit of a cilantro and onions maybe on the side or to go with the fish, you know, like the ceviche. But they, they, they think Americans are absurd for eating vegetables. So this is just like our American view. It's our American view, which isn't based on science. I mean, it's just not. It's based on 50 years of nutritional dogma that has, you know, been purported by vegetarians with an agenda. I mean, that's just the case. You know, it's, it's people that are biased. So there's more studies like that. This is another study. Increased, increasing the vegetable intake dose is associated with a rise in plasma carotenoids, without modifying oxidative stress or inflammation in overweight or obese postmenopausal women. I don't even have to read the abstract. It's all in the title. Mm -hmm. You can increase your vegetables. It doesn't change your oxidative stress markers. It's just wild. There are so many studies like this now. There's just study after study saying, hey, there's no benefit here mm -hmm. to doing this. And then I would, I would actually... <laughs> let people know about a last study, which is just a wild study. It's a little bit more complicated to sort of sort out, but I'll try and make it clear for people. So the name of the study is green tea extract only affects markers of oxidative status postprandially lasting antioxidant effect of a flavonoid free diet. Now this is a little bit confusing for people, but basically what happened in the study is they wanted to study the effects of green tea catechins on humans. And they looked at a number of things, oxidative stress, DNA damage, Again, they were looking at urinary 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, et cetera. But in order to study the effect of green tea catechins, they had to have a group that didn't have any flavonoids in their diet. So no flavonoids. We're talking, you know, no bioflavonoids. And flavonoids are a polyphenolic molecule. So they had, a, they had one group that had flavonoid-free. And that meant basically no fruits and vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So what they found, the green tea catechins didn't have any effect. But... What they said, so I'll read the end of the abstract, since no long-term effects of green tea catechin were observed, the study essentially served as a fruit and vegetables depletion study. Ready? Wait for it. Mm -hmm. The overall effect of the 10-week period without dietary fruits and vegetables was a decrease in oxidative damage to DNA, mm -hmm. blood proteins, and plasma lipids concomitantly with marked changes in antioxidant status. I said decrease. Wow. So what they're saying, they had a 10-week period, no dietary fruits and vegetables, markers of oxidative stress got better. Wow. <laughs> they got better. So if there are not jaws on the floor, minds being blown all over the place right now, I don't know what to say. But this is just really flies in the face of all the studies I was talking about earlier, which were epidemiology, right? So when people are hearing that fruits and vegetables have benefits in cardiovascular disease, blah, blah, blah. Those are epidemiology confounded by healthy user bias. When we look at interventional studies, we don't see a benefit. We see the reverse oftentimes. So this gets, let's just tie it back into polyphenols. Polyphenols are doing something beneficial in the human body from a hormetic standpoint, but that is not a unique benefit. And as the interventional studies would suggest, there's actually, if we look at it from a broader perspective, there's no benefit. You can maybe find a benefit in like cell culture or find a benefit if you're just looking at an acute administration of a whole bunch of sulforaphane in a controlled environment. But when we're actually doing the studies where we're giving people brassica vegetables, no changes in oxidative stress. It really flies in the face of the, any benefit to the polyphenols. And then as I noted, there are other damaging effects to these molecules. They are dangerous for humans which is the real problem. And this gets back to the issue of kind of like plant toxins and all these other issues. So mm. polyphenols, if you look at them, if you look at them closely, no benefit, probably very harmful. Do you want to talk about curcumin really quickly? I think that's a blow exactly. Yeah, let's talk about curcumin and brassica vegetables are the cauliflower, kale, cabbage, stuff like that. Supposed yeah. really healthy things that are low carb and people think are great. Yeah, I mean, People would argue, you know, brassica vegetables are the end all and be all. I mean, it's just a crazy concept. If you uh, think about it, this is hard. Vegetables, 
yeah, brassica vegetables are really, really trying to poison humans. <laughs> if, if we didn't blow your mind yet, let's blow your mind on curcumin. So curcumin is a multi-million dollar industry every year, and it is widely touted as an antioxidant. But there are two studies that I want people to read or at least be aware of. One of them is called The Essential Medicinal Chemistry of Curcumin, and the other is called The Dark Side of Curcumin. Now, in The Essential Medicinal Chemistry of Curcumin article, they even note in the abstract that curcumin is classified as a PANES, a P-A-I-N-S, which is called a panassay interference compound, and an IMPS, which they say is an invalid metabolic panacea candidate. And the they are saying the false activity of curcumin in vitro and in vivo has resulted in greater than 120 clinical trials of curcuminoids against several diseases. So what they're saying here is that in vitro, in a test tube, curcumin is an oxidatively active substance. Now, curcumin is a constituent of turmeric. Curcumin is a, is a polyphenolic compound found in turmeric. And so in a test tube, curcumin is a panassay interference compound, meaning that it looks like it's going to have antioxidant ability in the human body. And this has spawned an unprecedented number of clinical trials, 120 clinical trials. Now, I can just kind of let the cat out of the bag here at the beginning. The next sentence of the abstract is no double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial of curcumin has been successful. Mm -hmm. And yet it is a 30 to $40 million industry. No double-blinded placebo-controlled trial has been successful. So what we're dealing with here is a compound that looks good in a test tube, but that has no benefit in any randomized double-blinded control trial. This is crazy. And if we look into it, there's no surprise. This is kind of the same story as sulforaphane. The problem here is that it was it was really falsely labeled, right? This gets into the, the idea of, of it as a PANES, a panassay interference compound. It says PANES or panassay interference compounds are compounds that have been observed to show activity in multiple types of assays by interfering with the assay readout rather than through specific compound or target interactions. This is what has reacted in all of the hype, uh, resulted in all of the hype regarding curcumin. And then if you look at curcumin, it's very, number one, very, very poorly absorbed in the human body. Why is that? Because our body doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our body doesn't want curcumin. It has no use for it. It tries to get rid of it immediately. This has been the main problem with curcumin is that people have been trying forever to make curcumin more and more bioavailable, probably to the damage of thousands of people in the world, potentially hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Because well, our body doesn't want this compound. When curcumin comes into the body, just like when sulforaphane comes into the body, it is immediately detoxified. It goes through phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver and is excreted out as fast as it can be. It's going to circulate for a little while. It has a small amount of absorption, and that's where it's going to be toxic, just like sulforaphane. But our body doesn't want these things. Sulforaphane, curcumin, whatever molecule, these molecules are completely different than things like vitamin A. Your body doesn't take them in and store them. Your body sees it and goes, that is toxic. Get out of here. And that's phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver, which people can read more about. But the problem with curcumin, and this gets into something really interesting about black pepper, mm. is that one of the major ways that we detoxify curcumin is by glucuronidation, which is one of the phase two processes in the liver by which we add a glucuronide moiety to curcumin. And that is how we excrete it. Now, Black pepper is often packaged with turmeric or curcumin because one of the compounds in black pepper, piperine, inhibits the formation of UDP, excuse me, piperine inhibits the enzyme UDP glucuronosyl transferase. Piperine in black pepper inhibits our ability to do glucuronidation in phase two in the liver. And that is why we have higher levels of curcumin in our body when we take it with black pepper. This is a horrible mm -hmm. idea. It's actually a horrible idea to eat pepper at all because any pepper in your body is going to inhibit UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is going to inhibit the body's ability to do glucuronidation, which is a normal detoxification process in phase two. Okay. So why are we doing this? Because people want to try and increase the amount of curcumin in the body, but that's a real problem because when you look at curcumin, it has been shown to have reactivity against a number of human enzymes that are 
problematic. The first of which is called the HERG channel, which is H-E-R-G, which is a potassium channel. It actually has an interesting name. It's the human ether go-go channel. They mutate this channel in Drosophila flies, and they do a little dance that look like they're go-go mm-hmm. dancing. But in when we study curcumin, it's been found to bind to and inhibit HERG potassium channels. Well, that's not a good thing. Mm-hmm. It also interferes with cytochrome P450s, which are part of the phase one and phase two detoxifications in the systems in the liver. And curcumin can actually interfere with glutathione S transferase, which is the enzyme we use to put glutathione on a molecule to detoxify it. So they say the reactivity of each of these classes has important implications for potential side effects. Her channel inhibition is related to cardiotoxicity, cytochrome P450, and glutathione S transferase inhibition can lead to impaired detoxification of potential toxic drug drug contraindications. So they also go further to say beyond specific enzyme toxicity, curcumin has recently been shown to be an active iron chelator in vivo, inducing a state of overt iron deficiency in mice, and um, it can be toxic against normal cells in cell culture. So curcumin, all these studies are kind of studied in cancer cell lines, but they say in studies of therapeutic utility, curcumin has been reported as cytotoxic, cytotoxic against a number of important cancer cell lines. What is infrequently noted, however, is that it also shows cytotoxicity against normal human lymphocytes. Is this something that we want to be increasing in our bodies when our bodies are trying to get rid of it? I would argue no way. If you eat turmeric, your body's going to detoxify it normally, right? You know, turmeric is not toxic to humans. But don't eat turmeric with a bunch of black pepper trying to increase the amount of curcumin because you're causing stress on your body and it hasn't been shown in any double-blind randomized placebo control yeah, trial. Has it show, it's been shown it's supposed to reduce inflammation. So what 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 have we seen to play like the other side? Like what what are what benefit are people seeing? Because I know people say they swear by it or it's like, oh it cured my cancer or something. There's no that's what they say. There's no there's never been a double blinded placebo controlled trial that's been successful. We've never seen a fully controlled trial of curcumin that's been beneficial. So do you think there is some positives and or there is with no I don't. I don't think there are any positives. I think this is a molecule. Again, our bodies don't use it. It's not unique. Maybe it's a hormetic like sulforaphane, again, increasing glutathione, but it's going to have all these other negative effects on the body. You're going to inhibit P450. You're going to inhibit glutathione as transferase. You're going to inhibit the HERG channel. This is what I was saying. Different molecules from different operating systems. Our body doesn't know what to do with Mm -hmm. curcumin. And it's basically going to be toxic. And it could be directly toxic to human lymphocytes as well. So really a a dangerous molecule and perhaps the most dangerous piece of the equation is all of these people trying to make it in a liposome because you put curcumin in a liposome and it is really going to get absorbed in big concentrations and that can be a major Mm. problem. Liposome completely short circuits our normal body ability, our body's normal ability to weed out the molecules it wants versus what it doesn't. I don't think we should be putting anything in liposomes. Definitely not sulforaphane. Definitely not curcumin. That's a horrible idea. Mm. Wow. So be, the the better, so if people have success with this research, it's going to cause more damage possibly. So It could. It could. And if you look at the other paper, which is called The Dark Side of Curcumin, they say that um, chemical groups uh, on curcumin are known to covalently react to expose thiol groups of cysteine residues uh, of proteins through a reaction termed the Michael addition. This reaction may explain, for instance, why curcumin generates reactive oxygen species by irreversibly modifying the antioxidant enzyme thyroidoxin reductase, why curcumin induces topoisomerase, topoisomerase 2 mediated DNA damage, and why curcumin inactivates tumor suppressor protein P53. So they're noting even more dangerous things from curcumin, you know, um, for instance, for instance, curcumin concentrations of 2.5 and 5 milligrams per ml were shown to induce DNA damage to both mitochondrial and nuclear genomes and cells. Is this something we want to be putting in our body in a liposome? I mean, if you eat turmeric, you're probably not going to get enough curcumin to cause a problem. But is there any benefit? I would argue no. Mm. And it's really dangerous, especially when you start eating it with black pepper. I would argue black pepper is not something that we want to eat at all because we, our body needs to be able to do glucuronidation. We have to do this. 
And if we do that, if we eat pepper, we're going to inhibit glucuronidation. I mean, a little bit here and there, maybe not a big deal, but if we're just slamming curcumin every day with black pepper, we're probably doing a net negative. And so many of these things are so hard to sort out because if it doesn't kill us at the moment or make us vomit or have a headache, we're not going to notice what it's doing. But if we look at the science and we look at the ideas underlying this, it just gets back to this idea the polyphenols in plants are not beneficial for humans. They are not designed for humans. Mm -hmm. The plants are not giving us these polyphenols for benefit. If they have a benefit, it's only in one little area where they act as oxidative stressors and a mechanism that's redundant that we can do with our own normal life. And they have all of these other dangerous side effects on the side. Yeah, that's so interesting. And Oh my God, we, we have so much more to cover. I think we're going to have to cut this off and maybe we can talk again tomorrow and make this a two-parter because Let's there's so much more. Let's and I, I think you said this before, when we're talking about plant foods, maybe this can wrap it up for today. They're not, you know, you're talking about the, the, these fall fallback foods that we need them for, the, they'll get us through today, but they're not going to be good for us right. for the month or the year. Yeah, they're not longevity foods. You know, plant foods are short-term foods. They're short-term starvation foods. If we're out hunting animals, there's no animals. Yeah, you can eat some acorns for a few days, but they're not going to create the ideal state of micronutrient status or antioxidant status long-term. They're going to be dangerous for us. We can exist on them at some, what I would argue is a suboptimal level, for some amount of time, but long-term, major problems, major problems. They are not longevity foods. They are not foods that are meant to be eaten in perpetuity. They're short-term foods, but clearly animal foods are the ideal food. And if you look at long-term vegans, this is what you see sadly, is that people may do a vegan diet and they may eliminate processed food or sugar or dairy and have an improvement in the short-term, but the trajectory invariably in vegans is up mm -hmm. and then crash within two to three years. There's a whole host of vegans online right now saying, I ate meat and I felt so much better. Well, yeah, you know, the body can only last for two to three years on plant foods and then you're done, you know, and then you're going to be so wrecked and you may have developed these problems that are irreversible. So they're not good foods for long term. And I would argue there's no place for them at all in our diets if we're looking to be optimal, which gets into this concept of a carnivore diet and a well-constructed whole foods animal-based diet is, in my opinion, clearly the optimal diet for humans. Yes. Yes. So this this is great. So a teaser for next time, we're going to talk about all this carnivore stuff, nose to tail carnivore protein. People are like, oh, okay, well, I thought pro too much protein is bad. We can talk about genetics we can talk about lipids i want to talk about lipids uh, I want to talk about longevity mm -hmm. what else I talk about i want to talk about misconceptions about saturated fat um, mTOR IGF-1 people yes. are talking like oh they're like oh mTOR IGF-1 because you're gonna eat too much protein yep we'll talk about and what you eat i want to know about your routine and what you eat and uh, we both love to eat fish eggs we both yeah, love we to love eat uh, liver there's so much more so People, you can look all this stuff up. In the meantime, it, maybe it'll come out the next week after this one comes out, and then you can verify all this, and you're going to come back with your <laughs> your mind blown, and you'll come back for some more. Yep, yep, let's do it. All right, all right, Paul. Thank you so much. And and then I guess just for this time, we'll give we'll give a little bit of a plug for you. I think everyone should go go to your YouTube, your Instagram. They can even contact you for a consult if you're if they really want to dive into this. You do some some private consults. Yes. So probably the the best place to get a hold of me is at my email. It's Paul Saladino MD at gmail.com. I'm a functional medicine physician. Uh, as you heard in the intro, I'm a classically trained MD. And I do see people privately for consultation. If they want to reach out to me, please do so for a uh, functional medicine consultation through Gmail. You can find me on YouTube. I have sort of a series of lectures and interviews that I'm starting to do on my own YouTube channel, which is just findable under Paul Saladino MD. I'm on Instagram at Paul Saladino MD. I'm on Twitter at MD Saladino. And I'm on Facebook at Paul Saladino MD. I have a Patreon account, which is under my name, Paul Saladino MD, if people want to support my work in other ways. And we will be back soon for the thrilling conclusion. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I, I mean, let, let's cut it off for here and definitely check out Paul's work in the meantime and support him and 
We'll see you next time. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, of course, man. Great to be here. Bam, we're done. Get ready for part two. I'm excited for you. Don't forget to support me on Patreon. You can just search for Peak Human or click through the show notes. You can also get a copy of the film and other perks on Indiegogo. Also, you can support me by just clicking on that five-star icon in the Apple Podcast app. Follow along on social media. It's where all the fun is happening. Just search for Food Lies on any platform. Until next time, stay healthy and happy, my friends. Bye.